This is the Modern Craftsman Podcast with Tyler Grace from TRG Home Concepts, Nick Schiffer with NS Builders, Johnny Warhan, Vintage Builders, and Richard Trithui, the old guy from this old house. <laughs> this old plumber. <laughs> this old plumber. This old plumber. <laughs> so, nice to be with you boys. Likewise. Thanks pleasure, for coming pleasure on. on this side. Yeah, so. so, we're we are in booth C. Oh, yeah. Dang. You can. Yeah. Okay. All right. C 3819. Marvin Central Central Hall. Yes, and we're Huge booth. we're in a little eight by eight, very comfortable podcast Cozy. studio with excellent windows. Yeah, this excellent. Place. excellent, phenomenal. Yeah, we I can re- see. I can see myself. We requested these. <laughs> Is this a live feed? No, no. no. We can edit whatever you want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I so, wouldn't do that. <laughs> we want to dig into a lot, but we have what an hour. Good. All right. Um. I want to talk a little bit about what you guys are doing with the uh, Generation Next mm. and w- like you, where you guys are at with it, like today. Literally today, I'm hosting a panel that has Norm and Jeff and some others at uh, in another couple of hours in, f- in the big hall in the, in the South Hall, just re-identifying the issue. We got, a, we got arguably between four and five million skilled jobs available with nobody to fill them. It's the crisis that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Manufacturers have the issue. We all have the issue. It's been around for a long time. You know, it doesn't matter how it happened, but it it happened because Votex became dumping grounds and because Mm -hmm. the the paradigm in America was that you had to get a liberal arts degree. And sadly, many kids came out with debt and no job. And so there's just, it's it's maddening to me, for all of us, Tommy, Norm, all of us, for all of you guys, that... There are kids that should have worked with their hands that sort of got pushed into something that didn't set them up to, to succeed, and they, you know, and there's nothing better, you know, there's nothing better than coming back after a day or going back to a project you did and say, I did that, right. I did that. And you drive through town, and there's that pride that it's, it drives you guys. I mean, so do you think over the last two years that that the industry has already started adapting, or do you think it's still as much of a problem as it was two years ago? You know, I'm, I'm almost tired of talking about it. Right. I don't know if there's enough measurables. I don't know. You know what I mean? We know that we raise money. Money turns out to be the easy thing. Right. How do you, you know, how do we overcome the, all these hidden things like the metrics where a guidance counselor is only rewarded on his college placement percentage, not on putting kids into success, right? The realtor only drives uh, the property values in the town based on college, the schools and the college place, all of it. It's against, it's working against us all the time. And we got this housing stock that's all over 50 years old. All of it needs work. An industry that average age, the, the average age is 56 years old and we're retiring faster than the people coming in to replace so us. You try to, you fix the, you fix the guidance council issue yeah. and then, then you yeah. have something else. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that people realize how deeply rooted the problem is you know they just think that it's people aren't working with their hands but even as far as like you said with the guidance counselors and placement my oldest daughter started kindergarten this year and you can tell that that's something that they're pushing as far as their program uh from day one at is to get s- to at six to, years old you yeah. know with like how intense it is yeah. so that the the township you know has a good school district they can get more tax money it's yeah. crazy Dude, my yeah. six-year-old gets gets timed on how many math problems he can do in two minutes yeah. Yeah. and that's only so he can take a test for the school system yeah. sure yeah. and it's so. I, I don't know my, my son my sons are looking for the creative part of this yeah. where it's like working with their hands or right. going to, like they have already my oldest is 11 yeah. has the option of doing like latin or shop class they call it engineering yeah and i'm like what's engineering he goes dad a shop class yeah it's cool. amazing and i'm cool. like thank god and he's like it's the best part he comes home he made a uh, ipad stand yeah for his younger brother yeah it's just like and he's so proud of it and i'm like i'm almost like right. relieved that right. he has that connection to it a little bit in the old days of shop if you fumbled on a piece of wood you put three grooves in it and called it an ashtray <laughs> nowadays they make an ipad stand out yes. of anything. <laughs> everything's an ipad stand it's so true <laughs> so so i think yeah you know we do we do these public appearances and people do come up to us and say my kid went in because of you guys and stuff like that so to that level if we're making any sort of difference it's great but I just it's not trackable enough to know. It's tough to tell when you're immersed in that too, you yeah. know, who we revolve our ourselves around and 
the company that we sort of keep, it seems like it's so uplifting and everything's going so well and everyone takes so much pride, but you don't realize that on a greater scale, what we see isn't necessarily indicative of the entire industry. I'd love to, I'd love to copy the German model where at 12 years old or 13 years old, you make a de decision, the parents do, the kid does, to decide a path towards practical or college path. And then if and when you become a, in the case of a plumber, you also learn metallurgy and welding and brazing. And so by the time you get through that, that course, you are spectacular. You're a meister. They and do so much right over there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I, I don't like that you have to can only take your bottles back on Saturday morning. That's the only thing. That's that's the only thing? <laughs> no. That's it. And then you can only cut your lawn on a certain hour of a one day of the weekend. But other things. Otherwise. I think you're right, though. It's like you can't. It, it is hard to measure. And everyone, including ourselves, like we talk about, like, what are we doing? Is it making a difference? You know, and the more we talk about it, obviously, the more relevant it becomes mm -hmm. in day to day discussion. Mm -hmm. And the more it resonates with those kids those yeah. parents yeah. and you know that's you know generally what we're trying to do with the podcast is that you know we might not we might not create a school or create jobs mm -hmm. out of this but at least we're bringing attention to it and, right. we're, and we're having the conversation right. i mean you can be discouraged by this because you don't really have a tangible impact but i mean we this, talked about this last night this is someone. a system that's been against us for decades right. Right. so like it's not going to be a year and we're all fixed right so it's, and i think that's what a lot that. of people are like well it is still a problem. Is like, have have we done anything? But it's we we have it. Just it's not measurable enough to know that we're right. we're tracking the right way. My dad used to think we our family business was started in 1902. I was the fourth generation. But my dad was always the, it was the, our business was always the training ground, you know. And so he'd always say, adopt one kid, adopt one kid. We'd find somebody who's the son of somebody, and just he didn't know where he went, and we'd bring him in. It's, when you stand back from it now, 30, 40 years later, those kids are running the best service businesses. You know, we, we just that idea to adopt some kid and give him some some tactile, meaningful thing to do with himself and his hands or, or herself. So, but we, we start a lot of companies and that's okay. And it's tough because like I brought a kid in from the North Bend Street School <laughs> and he's, I don't know, 19? Yeah. And it's like, I, I just tell him uh, when our carpentry crews are there, I'm like, hey, just watch the guy on the stairs. Right. Don't do anything. Right. I'm paying you to do nothing, yeah. but just watch this technician work yeah. and just absorb it yeah. before you just get into overthinking it and start cutting stuff and getting all anxious. Right. Just for the next two days, do this. And then right. when he's done and the framing crew's there, right. take that up. And then if you find that you can start jumping into something a little bit and it's not the norm, everything's yeah. gotten, I mean, you've seen it where yeah. the pace has changed right. yeah. at everything. It's yeah. like, go. I mean, even the street lights, yeah. everything's go, go, go. So it's, that's what... I mean, Skills USA. I went to that, and it was like kids are getting judged on how many things they can finish a certain amount of time. And I'm like, yeah, we well, can't get away from this. I know, right? I know. Like, where's quality? I know. It, it's so tough to to navigate that and to make because it's money. How do you make money when you're taking your time? Right. I mean, it's usually later in the game you're able to do that. So to, I mean, to start off. I mean, that's I, I preach this all the time. It's like my anyone I hire, I'd rather them take as long. Like Tyler joked about it last on the last podcast is this is why I don't make any money, but it's I'll, I'll suffer in up front and like, let them learn at my expense and like let, letting this kid, you're paying him by the hour, learn and take his time to just, maybe he gets his hands wet, maybe he doesn't. But the fact that like a year, two, five, ten 10 years from now, like now the qual the quality has been developed and speed will come later. But it's the mindset like to in our industry. The, no, but him that per, like that carpenter that, that, he has to learn that mindset that it's not speed and it's about the quality and right. he might have another avenue. I mean, that's how I came up in the industry. I watched you guys on the show, but it was like, I had, my, my, my boss was 62 back in the day. Mm -hmm. And like, it was like, he was against, you know, pneumatic guns, anything yeah, that. Anything so it was new. old school, but now it's so <clears throat> different. There's no way to, to get, and he, he was a, a firm believer of, hey, you put, you put a roof on, you, hang, you hit it by hand. Yeah. That way you know, but basically he was saying, hey, there's still gaps in the, in the sheathing, even though we're still doing plywood. He was living that old dream, but right. it was about the methods. Yeah. So now you knew it, and now I can then manage because I know what to expect from 30 feet away. Yeah. And if that kid's going to you know, watch that carpenter, he, he gets to know what it is first, comprehend it, and then move on. Yeah. He'll be a better business owner in the future. So when I, when I have kids, 
Kim decided to apprentice under, under us, I'd always say, just relax, just relax. But I want you to be thinking, as you're watching the mechanic do something, be thinking, what's the next thing he's going to need? And if you start critically thinking that way, all of a sudden you'll internalize the steps. And a couple of kids have come and said, oh, it made, it made me relax a little bit because it was, it, if you're not, you're reacting all of a sudden to the, 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 and the old school mechanics are always these belligerent sort of mean spirited. Yeah. So, so. Uh, it's so true. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing. I, I, I coach hockey. There it is. And, oh, and, and the hockey reference. And <laughs> yeah. No, it's like you can teach the kids how to skate, but to teach them anticipation yeah. is really the art yeah. of, yeah. of coaching Where's or teaching yeah. or of being a good boss yeah. is that, hey, when I was an apprentice or a laborer, it was always like he always reaches for this tool, this tool, this tool. So I'm going to give right. him the third tool because right. he only has two hands. So he's yeah. going to reach for these two yeah. and do that. And then I'd go buy those three tools. Yeah. You know, that was kind of how it worked. And right. it was more of right. not being in the mix, but just kind of viewing it mm-hmm. and I think like my my youngest is more like that like he'll watch something happen like at school he won't be the first one to do it but he'll watch it and then he'll just pick up on it and then he'll cross check you yeah, no, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's the same thing I mean, it's <laughs> my kids are just more like let's watch it understand it and then go do it and that's a lot of how I learn things mm-hmm. I'm not a pen to paper yeah I learned I learned with a guy when I first got into the family business there was a guy there Bill Genson he'd been there 50 years and so this was this was 1970 or so so he was there in 1920 wow and so back so the thing was what's changed through the years has been the speed of the connections you know it was poured lead joints and it was threaded brass and so that's really what to, when you talk about speed that's the only evolution or iteration in the industry is how do you get a another connection that saves you time but doesn't compromise quality. Uh, quality so well i mean look at pro press mm, right I know. like copper and it, i mean we deal with it regularly especially in high-rise construction like the, they don't want us with the flame yeah but it is like how about the, the flame school you have to go to for the license oh my god sorry <laughs> we have to go to a flame school sorry for what uh, to teach plumbers that if you put a torch against wood, it'll burn the house down. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's a, it's a really organized part of license or licensure. But it's, uh, it's, it comes right after common sense. <laughs> right there. So, I feel like right there. a lot of people need that. <laughs> yeah. You'd so, be surprised. So. But it's, it's like we talked about on, again, on our last, last podcast that... You New, talked a lot on your last we podcast. Did, we Everything did. was in the last it's podcast. That's all we do. You're right. So I'm not even talking about this one. I'm that's talking right. about the, my well, past. We haven't put anything into this one yet. No, but it's the, the evolution <laughs> of product, right? <laughs> Can I just stop for a second? It, every time I've met you, like people, you, you, there's people that you watch your whole life and you kind of see what's going on. And then you kind of have this, not the stigma, but this, like what they are. And it's like, you're on a pedestal. You've always just been a genuine, like, <laughs> bump into one of us be one of the guys <laughs> that's right which is i just want to tell people that are listening like it is so funny like just the jokes you crack yeah it's well i can't always crack them on the joke on the show <laughs> this is a podcast i can do anything right? yes you can <laughs> okay good well it's been fun hey um, <laughs> it's been fun. no but it's like the evolution of product right? right is that you're talking about speed the speed in it and you know we always you know there's always that comparison is like well is a pro you know pro press is junk like oh it's gonna fail it's a rubber oh, yeah. sale blah blah oh, blah yeah. Oh, yeah. everyone fights it but it's it's still the same thing where it's if you're installing it correctly you know it's gonna last just as long as if you oh, yeah. install a solder drink correctly oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and I think that's where people lose sight is that everything becomes faster and it and it's it's automatically thought of as the easy way out or the cheap way or it ruins the craft it's like so, you still need to learn the right, right way to do it so for all these years on this house I've always been showing the next new thing yeah so fully 90% of the plumbers when I first started showing solderless connection or whatever oh and then you know then they, you win them over and then you do the next thing instantaneous water heaters and radiant heating and you know small duct type of loss you know like just one after another was always this like the old timers would just say no skeptic yeah and well look at Megapress for gas yeah, I know no threading machine I know no oil I know it's but you know what's crazy it, it, you hear about you, the new nightmare though just, just coming yeah. out today Somebody came along and invented this yoga pipe. Oh, which for is, the AC condensers. For AC condensers. We had one fail. We tried Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. It's my worst nightmare. It's yep. like somebody's going to try new technology, and thank goodness I didn't show it. But it's, it's what you worry about. And then, and what happens is the poor contractor takes it in the head. 
because he was the one that tried something new and it makes this the naysayers say i see i told you we should have stayed with yeah. you know no yeah. no pneumatic I, tools i was the one that told them to yeah. try it we to tried try it and it failed that's right so it was nick schiffer schiffer two f's <laughs> Um, I'm glad you pronounced my last name. Right. Troublemaker. <laughs> Troublemaker. Nailed it. Troublemaker. <laughs> um, but it was. It was a. It was a product that was marketed. It's like this is genius. You're dealing with copper pipe that you know if the guys bend it or something goes like right. it's. It made. It made sense. Except it was plastic and the pressures of. Right. So that's the other. The damn yeah. physics. Unfortunately, the damn physics. It's not always the new products aren't always the right the right choice. But I think it, it does. It comes down to the fact that you still need to be educated. Right. You still need to be right. taking the, the, the proper steps. Right. And so it, I love this podcast life. So we just you just riff anything yep. anywhere we want to go. Oh, yeah, we just banned This it. is all yeah. scripted. Yeah. 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 I see the storyboards everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, we just roll. Now oh. you guys you guys recently uh, maybe I'm misspeaking, did you guys recently partner with Keep Craft Alive or Find Home Building? Uh, there's all sorts of partnerships going on, all kinds of re- alliances, relationships. So um, I'm not sure what the official answer to that one is. But, okay. Um, we're, you know, it's our brand is so so big and sort of all encompassing, and so we, we're trying to get with more and more people like like you guys. You know, that's sort of the new the new level of social influences, and right. you know, magazines are all looking for another way to come to market. So you know, there's nothing. There's, you know, maybe I'm biased, but but this house brand is gold. It's just like, Absolutely. you know, it's just like, all day. Yeah, all day. You know, like we've been spoiled. Our producers are so spoiled because they can call up any manufacturer and say, hey, we're thinking about doing a show. And, yeah. You know, like the most amazing thing was we wanted to do some windows. We wanted to do some American windows on our project in London a million years ago. So I'm not sure. I think it was these guys. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, we, we, rip the building apart we get the windows ordered but we have a schedule and there's nothing more amazing than seeing the fedex truck deliver the windows to england <laughs> because we had to have it done on time and they showed up on time it's just like yeah we can actually like like samantha the witch we could just say can you please have it overseas <laughs> without breaking a glass you guys get to cut the line yeah that's right so, yeah so it's all been fun now, it's amazing how it's gone by it's been been a crazy ride how long you been with the show 40 years wow wow so we started the winter 78 79 and uh, i took the phone call it was a woman named avra friedfeld from wgbh and she was a production assistant and she said hi i'm avra from wgbh and we heard you guys are good and i want to tell you we have an idea for a tv show so she's already said we, that she heard we were good and then she says but i gotta warn you we're public television. We have no money. So you'd have to probably work for nothing. So I was 22 years old. I remember the phone, you know, the old AT&T phones. The fla- I say, hold on a minute. And I can say this on a podcast. I said, I said, hey, Dad, there's some crazy woman <laughs> on line two that wants to do some stupid TV thing. And I hear him pick up the phone and he says, geez, that sounds great. Yeah, we'd love to. You know, we love PBS. We love, you know. And he hangs up and I said, why? Because I didn't think it made sense. And he says, you know what? We're having a good year. Let's pay it forward. Maybe it'll help the plumber's image. And so he was more worried about, you know, liquid plumber and three guys plumbing and the whole sort of bad perception. And then he did that first year. And literally, if you ever saw him at home the night before, he couldn't sleep. And then he'd wake up in the morning and he'd have suds, dry suds on his mouth because he was so nervous. <laughs> and then the, they put the camera in front of him and the blood would just drain out of his head. <laughs> and the first thing he ever did was a, a boiler thing in, in Dorchester with Vila. And the Vila says, so what's this? So Ron, Ron Trithui is our, our heating and plumbing guy. And Ron, what's this? And, and he says, it's a boiler, Bob. And he's, he's yelling. <laughs> he's yelling. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so then... And Bob says, so what's it do? And he just repeats the same line. It's a boiler, Bob. <laughs> Cut. We have, to, we have to sort of rub his back and calm him down. And then he did one year and it was enough. He said, Richard, you too dumb to be nervous or too young to be nervous or whatever. <laughs> so, and it's been a ride. That's crazy crazy. Ride. Crazy ride. If you I, don't have experience doing that, it's, it's awkward. I oh, mean, totally. it, even just to have somebody point a, a camera phone at you and film you. Yeah. Um, 
and you know most of the people who are involved with it are tradesmen yeah. they didn't get in to be right. on tv right. and they're not cut from that claw. My, my biggest f- problem early early on yeah. was i grew up third generation for, uh, fourth generation in my family and i had to deal with this am i giving away the magician's secrets and so and i just i and then i just had to have a, this epiphany it was two years in three years in i just said I can't worry. I can only worry about me. I just can't worry. And once I did that, it just made me exhale and relax. And you know. And then what I did find is that people I respect very much in my industry appreciated that I was putting out a good image for the plumber. I was putting out a good image, you know, and showing new stuff, which also made it easier. If on this old house we always show the right way, the most expensive right. way. The marketplace will figure out how to come to market for less. You know, they'll find out the best the right. best way to do it. So, we always want to show the best, and then and that works. And so it helps everybody sell up too. I think if, if I we mean, showed the low end. Forty. I mean, forty years ago, the fact that your father said, "Let's pay it forward," mm. and like immediately. I never was, heard that. I didn't hear that that saying again until the movie that made it a popular saying. Like it was. It didn't. I didn't know but what it that was the, like the mindset that you know we don't have to share everything. Let's share. Right. Like, I mean, we, we we should share everything yeah. and help everyone. Yeah. Where I be, I I feel like between forty years ago and today, the only people that were sharing were you guys. Right. Yeah. Right. It was only the show. Right. Like, right. And everyone's like, no, I got to keep my secrets. It's like, why are you keeping a secret? Rich right. is teaching me yeah, it on I know. TV. I know. It's like you're you're doing yourself and who you're surrounding a disservice. Mm-hmm. And you now talk, it, you talk about sharing, Nick. My father used to have the, the plumbing association come and allow them to have their meetings at our shop. And he would leave everything out for them to see, what we charged. And, I, and at the time, at first, I said, why would you do this? He said, look, it makes everybody a better competitor because they're all going to be two bucks less than us. That's fine. But at least it elevates them to get their, their yeah, rates. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? They and so he was never less. afraid. And he was never mad like I would be quite often. You invest in a kid, you invest in a kid, and he goes off on his own. The first reaction, the first reaction is, the first reaction is, ah, you know, he betrayed us. Mm. And you can't. You got to say, look, you wanted to give this kid a chance to make his make his mark. So, yeah, I mean, but that's that's kind of the. I look at it more like I taught them enough that they've gone on their own. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like ideally it's on good terms, meaning, yeah. hey, you know yeah. what. I think I've reached my ceiling here. Until and they take your best customer. <laughs> True, but I mean, I think I, it's a really tough part in the business where yeah. you, like Nick, we talk about all the time, like Tyler, you do a lot of your stuff hands-on, so there is no break. But yeah. like as we get management put in, in place, you don't become the lifeline for that client, and then that does happen where mm. it's I've done it myself. Yeah. And it's like it gets to a point where, you know, what, why do I need that, that extra overhead? What are they actually doing? But it becomes that the infrastructure that's been created, you're able to work better inside that environment that they have. And if if you can stay in touch with that client by still having a manager there, that's the key because that's the fun part. Right. To be honest, the bills right. and everything else, it's being creative and, and taking that organic idea that the client has and turning it to reality. Whether it's a boiler room that's the sexiest thing I've ever seen, like on this old house, but mm. or you know just another room. Yeah. You know that's that's the tough part. So you can still give them everything and still. It's, it's your job to hold the client. I think yeah. that the tough part with that, there's a fine line. I think that obviously we all talk about disclosing those trade secrets or letting people in you know, to see the inner workings of your company. I think that does elevate the industry as a whole. But what about the other side of the spectrum where I, I firsthand experience see people now seeing other, seeing ways that people market themselves or they you know, claim to be this person and they take those tactics, they take those techniques, and then they aren't stepping up to the plate, and they aren't necessarily walking the walk at that point. You just sit back and just wait for that person, you know, for the truth to come out. This is who, this is who you are. You aren't necessarily the same person that you're conveying yourself. What do you, what do you really mark- mean there? Somebody that says they, and so like, tell me. So I do a lot of my marketing <clears throat> is showing way showing what i do to differentiate differentiate myself from other people now i see a lot of people who are using the same tactics techniques whether it's site protection methods but i know you know i've walked their jobs i've seen their work and they aren't necessarily living up to the way that they're marketing right. themselves you should be honored they're they're flattering you by copying your your marketing strategy sadly but 
sure, but what about for the <clears throat> customers, you know, that now... We're paying a premium for yeah, lack of service. And, and like, it's more so just kind of ripping off a marketing where I, I people still aren't think stepping this, up to the I plate. Mean, this like, industry is... It's more self-indexing now than it's ever been because of social media and the fact that people can communicate in other ways they could never do. You could have a scammer in the construction trade who could get away with it a long time before people right. caught on to yeah. it. It's different now with, yeah. with the... You know the Yelp equivalency or uh, yeah, I don't Angie's. think you, I don't think you need to like necessarily call them up because they're going to they're going to fold within themselves yeah. anyway. Th- their clients are going to be the ones that you right. know, like Johnny. You say it all the time. It's like I'll give you the playbook. Your my execution is going to be way better. I just work way mm-hmm. too hard. Right. right. Like the, the odds like, of someone else doing that, putting the hours I, in. And if I should I, sh- I shouldn't admit to this, but when I had a competitor that wasn't as good as he might have been, I remember doing this. Whenever we got really busy. I'd say, uh, 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 oh, I, you know, I just checked the board. We're, we're tied up. Let me think about it. who can I get you? Who can I get you? And I knew that this <laughs> no. this prospect had lied to me on the first date. Meaning, you know, it said something I didn't, or just I just smelled a rat. Yeah. And I just said, I would say, oh, you know, oh, call this guy Billy Pitts, and I would give out this guy's name. And I single-handedly gave him two years worth of the worst customers <laughs> ever. <laughs> and literally, <laughs> if you're listening, Billy, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's too funny. That's that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. and you, solid. You keep your keep your competitors busy with challenges. Yeah. So, it's it's it is. I mean, it, it's a fine line there. And I, I mean, I guess firsthand, I've seen, I've been called on to three jobs lately where the customers told me you know they they appeared to check in on who this person was and everything checked out and one of the jobs was a complete tear out of everything that they had paid for and it's going the legal route and everything yeah. else um that's the only thing that does concern me with it's frustrating that. yeah and it just i i mean i've been ripped off by subs and i'm supposed to be the professional and i know what goes into it and i'm still having these issues and then you have the homeowners that don't know anything that's why they're hiring you and they're supposed to kind of weed through where everyone appears to be the same and now you're taking people's words for it and everything let else. me let me just put this in though that the the prospect is the unindicted co-conspirator in dissatisfaction because they believe in the tooth fairy mm-hmm. they think they can go low price right and get everything that the high price person was doing and it just can't happen it's just it's, it's a there's a law to it and so and they they continue to do it, and so you can't get you well, can't get like a lot when, for little. It's like when someone comes to you with like, "Hey, I want this house, but I only want to spend this much money," mm, right. and they're like, "Yeah, I can build that." Yeah, and it's just like right. you you're not going to build right. that. Like you're going to build a rendition of that, right. but you're and then at the end of the job, the client's going to be yeah. just not satisfied. Right. So I remember I used to run the tape on the the bids for you know a replacement heating system or something, and you know I'd come up with the number and. I'd give the number to the consumer and they'd say, wow. And I'd say, you know what? It's amazing. I just, I just, I remember when I ran these numbers five years ago and it was, it was half, you know what I mean? And I would be like in awe with them, like saying, it's crazy. And I would always finish with, but this is really what we got to charge to get and keep really good people and pay all the licenses and do the insurance and make sure that you don't, you don't get in trouble. And don't, don't forget the permits and the inspection thing. And I'd rattle off this litany and they go, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you got to defend your price. I mean, we don't talk, like we don't talk a lot about pricing, but I think that's where, you know, taking that transparency when you do price. Like when a client, we talked about the big number. It's like you look at the big, everyone jumps to the big number. It's like a million dollars. And then right. they go back up and they look at each line and like, right. yeah, that makes sense. That checks off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just didn't realize that all those small numbers added up to a million. I know. And it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, you know, you're but it's also the people that are saying it, like to Tyler's point earlier, that you guys can talk about the numbers. Like, what is my overhead? What is that number? What's that 15 to 18% get me? And I think part of social media that's cool is that you can show the people behind you know, the cloak, meaning, hey, yeah. these people that do my books, right. all this stuff, that, that's where the overhead goes, the fleet of trucks, the insurance, is that when people, I mean, there was decades ago when someone asked me what the overhead was, and I'd be like, it just it's thirteen percent. Like, or, or you'd say, I work out of my house. I have no overhead. <laughs> like, yeah. but, it, but knowing that what your costs are, Fly being dialed into it, is key. Because yeah. it's the same way you talk about windows or plumbing. It's like you know it inside and out. You should know where your numbers are, yeah. and you can speak to it. So when someone asks, "Hey, 
you know like the issue we always we always actually refer to plumbers is like you can't buy your faucets on faucet.com like my plumber's not handling it if it breaks they're not warrantying it so those all that is in that they're hand, when it gets delivered you're delivering it you're dr- dropping it off you're opening the bag make sure that all everything's in it like right. as a homeowner that's your job right if i'm not touching it i'm not marking it up right then you're responsible for all of it if it's wrong you're responsible for my plumber coming out trying to install it, then he leaves, mobilizes twice. And once you can say that in like a kind of a productive Rational manner, way, yeah. yeah, then they're like, I get it. But no one else, the other guy that's faking it, is just like, I don't know how to answer that question. I used to say, when people say, I want to buy my own toilet or whatever, I'd say, you know what? I know, I, but I tried this the other night. I just, I bought some meat and I got some veggies and I brought it into this local restaurant. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> and I had him cook. I had to cook it, and then I got sick, and I just didn't know whether to blame him or me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true, so though. True. That's that nonchalantness. Yeah. But it, you also have to get to that point. You know, there's a lot of guys and girls out there who are just starting who want the job or need the yeah. job where they're willing to kind of bend those rules and let people do stuff because they don't want to let a job slide away. You know, Then you can we, fall in love with the design. Sure. You talk about this. Oh, yeah. But, I mean... Uh, we're lucky enough to have put ourselves in a position that we can kind of stand our ground with respect If you to that. close 100% of the jobs, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something yeah. really, really wrong. But, so, but how do you vet, I mean, you're an elder here, you know, you, everything's casual with you. How do you vet clients that come to you and they want your name, they want your quality, but how do you, I mean, you must get a, a million phone, I mean, exaggerating, but yeah. It's got to be, compared to us, the phone's going to be ringing off the hook, and then you can't do it all. I think you have to be skeptical. When Tyler just talked about the young kids, they go in wide-eyed like a puppy. Oh, everybody's going to pay me the, everything I want. And it, it, I think you've got to go in cat, uh, with, a, with caution. Buyers are liars many times, and sort of look and sort of, you know, you, you should be interviewing them like they're interviewing you. And if it's an equal, belly-to-belly, eye-to-eye, it's a whole different relationship than oh here here's my right and you just hope that everything goes right and it never goes right so you're always gonna then you get mad at the end of the project so i just i think you you should interview the the prospect i don't i don't think there's there's some people you shouldn't work for that there's not a fit there's just not a fit and there never will be how big's your how big's the plumbing company uh they're what are they now i don't know 12 trucks 14 trucks something like that wow you know, and uh, and I'm not active in that business at all. No, no, I have a manufacturer's rep business that I've done for a long time. What happened after many years of being on the show, I started getting samples of products from all over the world and uh, tried them out. And I realized that all of these products, you're not going to, unless there's a champion that can explain it in lay terms to the contractor, you never can. So I was there for dollar one of radiant floor heating in New England, dollar one of Viesman boilers. Dollar one of uh, Unico Small, you know. So we pioneered it by getting, and it really is to use my contract of friendships to say, hey, I'll try it and make sure you go in the, in the foxhole with them. So, because it was all new. Like we were, those systems were twice as much money than, you know, a baseboard system or a bad ducted system. And so they had, there was this leap of faith they took with me. And you know what? They did it, they, it worked. They made their money, and all of a sudden they were completely confident to sell another one, and it changed them. In many ways, it changed them. I mean, we still have friendships from 30, 40 years ago that were just selling new work plumbing, which you can't make any work money at new work plumbing. You can make money at heating and ventilating and comfort and selling a higher-end product there, and so that's where I've been for 30 years. So. Yeah. Coaching. Coaching, cheerleading. It's <laughs> funny because even um, Marvin with their integrity line, when they're speaking to that line they don't when i spoke with one of their distributors it was basically that there's no there's nobody to go to these contractors and help them pitch this right. product you know they if they wanted to educate them it's a little bit but then i, I i'm having a conversation with them i'm like so you're depending on your contractors to analyze these products use these products and then sell them and that that's like that's all you're putting into this. I just feel like that's a disaster because if contractors use Anderson 400 series windows forever, why are they going to now switch to a higher dollar product? They don't know anything about it and then go in and sell it. And it's like, why aren't there people in place to train these contractors to the ins and outs of this product, why it's better so that it's not just 
relying on the contractors to kind of spark up this knowledge themselves. I think to what you're speaking of is one of the, the sort of paradigms of this whole house. When I first got into the industry before this whole house, you know, what the consumer was got, what the consumer was offered was CWC, cheap, white, and chrome, because that's what the plumber would give him, right? It was just basic. And that was the same with the equivalent best windows. There was no way for a consumer to know about anything new or other, other than the basic offering, except, and all of a sudden, what this house did was it would show products up and over the top of the market and create demand the other way. Because before, with the conventional model, as your manufacturer gets excited, he has a national sales manager, the national sales manager has a regional guy, a regional guy has a, a just series of distributors, and the distributors have salespeople, and by the time it gets to the contractor, that message has been watered down or not, it doesn't even get through, and we changed it by creating desire and uh, information over the top and make it, just inverted it completely. And so, and it, then, what we're doing now is the natural culmination of that. Culmination of that. So, and the other thing that coincided with us starting was Home Depot. Same year, '78. Mm, really? Yeah. I think it's interesting. Like in the beginning, you said that you guys are promoting the highest quality and often most expensive sure. systems, and you're doing it to inform the market. Yeah. So then the market can then respond by figuring a way to make it more affordable. Yeah, they'll figure out a way to do it cheaper. Everybody, everybody does. We want to show the best. If it's the hardest, it doesn't matter. So, right. And people will say, well, why don't you talk about prices? And we say, okay, if we talk about prices, there's regional differences in labor and even materials across the country. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, though, if we talk about price, our product, that we it, it doesn't remain as evergreen because if we want to show it five years from now, right. those prices, we did that in year one. We talked about prices and we had to go back and blurt out the change, uh, you know, obscure the prices because people would think it was so crazy. But not only that, I mean, a lot of times, you if you mention price too soon, people shut off. Mm -hmm. like, Agreed. Yeah. I was going to say that like, you'd rather yeah, dig not, into it. Not into me. Like, I forget, yeah. you and I went there to, what was, what, what, which one we go to? Uh, a couple years ago. Arlington. Arlington. And we went right down the mechanical room. Yeah, and all the green and pipe. All the green pipe. And what we didn't, we just took photos of it. And then I went, we both went back on our own time and Googled it. Yeah. And we like, did our own research. Whoa, and then we went expensive. to our reps to be like, yeah. what is this? And like, how does yeah. it work? It fuses it, yeah. its own joints together. Or like, therm. Yeah, but it's, but we want, I think if you said the price on that, I may not have even researched that. Never <laughs> know that that limit is right. there. And it was. You just were like, fun. yeah, that's not for me. I can't fit that in. Yeah. yeah. Like, just a meet in total yeah. shut off. Yeah. We did the same thing with the floor in there. Yeah. We're like, is yeah. it finished? And like, that's Loba. And we're like, Loba, Loba, where's my right. phone? Yeah. I, that down. Down. I used it on the next job. I was like, done, so. Totally true. <laughs> what was there before Google? Memory. Right. right. <laughs> I'm at capacity. <laughs> I just think that, I, I think a lot of people. I, talk, I again talking about transparency and like sharing I just I think so many people are so skewed by it that their their unwillingness to help is you know is almost blurred by their own ego and it's like mm -hmm. I need I I'm competing yeah. and like to Tyler like to your point like the guy that's saying that I can do just what TRG does I, I'll do all the site protection like that one client unfortunately for them made a mistake yeah. Yeah. and they're going to, and they're going to lose. And, and hopefully, you know, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately for the industry, like that looks bad for everyone because it's like the guy lied and he's a contractor contractors lie. But all you can do in that manner is that you can continue to uphold what you promise and up your game and up your game. Right. And you know, naturally, like naturally people are going to realize that, that guy's a liar and you're not and you're the real deal sometimes customers get the contractors they deserve yeah very true. <laughs> i feel like that's everything you get what well, you what bill you Pitts deserve or bill pitts or whatever <laughs> you get the design you deserve you get the project you deserve i feel like that is that is the case with life i also think it comes with experience <clears throat> that, yeah like, the people i say no to now and and the triggers that set me off to be like eh, no i think i'm good like the key is you can't be militant. You got to let them go away, not knowing that you didn't have any interest. Exactly. In. You just yeah. have to do it in a. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You need. They need to. <clears throat> like you need to make them feel as though they made that choice. Yes. Because then they walk away like, no, I decided not to use him. That's right. And then they're like, why? And they're like, 
I actually don't know. Yeah. And that's like the best because but they just feel okay about yeah. it, and that's all that matters. Right. But I just think I think a lot of people listen to the podcast that are all different points of their career, and it's like I, I, I just know how I would feel if I was listening to this 15, 20 years ago. I'd be like, I, I don't know how to say no. Yeah. Like I'm just trying to like uh-huh. beyond the competition part of it is just trying to, to make a living. Right. right. You know, that was the hardest part was that, hey, yeah, I'll do the basement job. I'll do the like I went to college and my professor had a huge issue with me and I gave it to him. I went back and forth with it. And he, I'm like when I when I was doing work in, in Norwood in, in Brookline, we would do a small bathroom and then we would do a whole house. And I went to school and was like, this is what you do. We do. This is my model. We're doing this. And he's like, you can't. The people that want the $2 million house don't want the guy that's doing a $40,000 bathroom. And I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it right now. Right. Like, and I, so it was like, <clears throat> I didn't understand it. But yet the, the instructor couldn't give me like a legit answer back then. Right. I get it now that like, unless that bathroom's like top notch, that would be in that house. Right. You can't do a down ski. You couldn't put in a bunch of, you know, knockoff product in that and then still have the same mm. clientele. Well, yeah, I mean that $2 million house they're going to be like have you built a two million dollar house yet oh well no i'm doing this really nice bathroom it's like great you're going to do a really nice bathroom in my house but i also need the rest of the house done but no but if i think about it now it's like there's different layers of of subs that we all see and like the guys that i got to do that discount bathroom for i can't bring any of those guys in so mm-hmm. in efficiency as a gc i need to have my role of subs that do both they're not going to go take that bathroom job and do a a lesser grade plaster to save two grand it's just it doesn't happen it's a right. fairy tale right. so now i don't know i'm out of school <clears throat> with 20 years now it's like now i get what my instructor was saying but back then i just didn't see it yeah i was in my own little bubble and it just i think it's really tough that people want to say no they don't know how to and it will come in time is yeah. my point long-winded way but yeah so you just made me think of a story um you know our, our family business we used to do a ba- like a bathroom a week. We did 50 bathrooms a year and we did a, a ton of uh, boiler replacements. And I remember back then, uh, way back when, a bathroom was 10 grand and a boiler was four or five grand. You know what I mean? So I remember going to the the big plumbing association meetings down at Joseph's Aquarium on the waterfront and, and all these guys are there and they say, and they're boasting, they just did a, a $3 million job, you know, at a high rise and this guy did a $7 million, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in the car, I'm driving back with my dad, and I said, so, so Dad, we only do like ten and $5,000 jobs. And he says, did you ask those guys how much money they get to keep? Yeah. <laughs> and so then, true. And all those guys, they all had their 10 years, and then they went out of business <laughs> because they, they bid one wrong and stuff like that. Right. So, so we've always just done it building with single, hitting, hitting singles and building the business with the bigger Getting customers. RBIs. Yeah, yeah. Is that, so is that the premise of the business now? I think so. Yeah, they yeah they just stay. They they don't do monstrous houses. They just you know water heaters, faucets, bathrooms, kitchens. You know, just who took the business over after my brother, my brother Bob, and then he's got this unbelievable kid that we adopted. This is a kid that was a neighborhood kid in our hometown of Dedham. My dad liked him. He came in. It turns out that he's turned out and saved that company because my you know he's when the recession came. My brother was too nice, didn't want to lay off too many people. And then all of a sudden, the pressure of this big overhead business. And so this kid, Michael, came in and just saved it. It's, it's a blessing, you know what I mean? Because you don't want to lose a 1902 business, you know. It's right. hard to keep them going. Yeah. It's hard to keep them going. So it's crazy. Unbelievable. Now, crazy. Now, Ross is on the the other side of it, like the engineering side of it. Yeah. Ross has his own you know, uh, TE2 as an engineering firm that was started as an imprint inside of RST Thermal. RST Thermal is it's my initials. I used to call it Radiant Systems Technology when we first were pioneering Radiant. And then uh, and we we're in Westwood. And so Ross, Ross, when he got out of Tufts, he started working with Wiesman Manufacturing as their solar expert. And then when Wiesman parted companies, they, they decided, they, they said, we're going to go factory direct. Thank you, Richard. And they took the line. So Ross said, I'm not going with them. And my other son, Evan, is just getting out. So it turned out to be this amazing blessing where I, you know, all, it's all I could ever hope for, dream for, is to work with my two kids. They're both smarter, better, taller, faster than me in, in every way. And so we took this RST Thermal, and then Ross, Ross got going with 
doing engineering for some of the clients that I'd used to give it to, you know, on the on the vineyard, on Cape Cod, Nantucket, and he would do it, and they loved him because he he could he knew the t- stuff, but he also could explain it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the hard part. Is you know, some of these, some of these engineers just scare you because they're just they can't they can't explain it. Yeah. Right. So he he's taken that to a new level. My younger one, Evan. You haven't met Evan yet. He's he's doing stuff with our with our RST thermal. So they're both in great shape, and we're we're in a happy place. We're in a happy place. So knock on wood. That's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's I, I think what I like about Ross and you know for that project that we're working on, it's all de- developed around comfort, and that's what you know that's where you start resonating with homeowners and like we, we always talk about it you know we have two projects that that was a huge conversation in the beginning is that how do you live in the home and you know what are what's important to you right because you know i i genuinely believe that most people move out of their home because they're uncomfortable i mean you, you know the numbers right i mean two different surveys one is 80 percent one's 83 percent what number of people are unhappy with their heating and cooling system in this country it's pitiful but it's not like that's it's, e- it's not even the first thought it's just i'm uncomfortable in my home i'm gonna move I know. and it's never you know because it's never considered up front where it's like we have our that the lake drive project we wanted to make sure that that all of that stuff was thought out right. ahead of time right. to make sure that you know when they move in that that's never a concern comfort is a hard thing for people to articulate though you could ask somebody what's important to you and the husband and wife they're not gonna really understand how to answer that question they they just want immaculate conception when it comes to comfort they want to see nothing hear nothing right. they want to be perfect 68 Magic. perfect right. relative humidity and they want to give you no space for mechanical run right that's the standard program and they want to have a thousand gallons of hot water <laughs> for when they get off the beach and the whole family's there for the summer house you know, you know yeah so but i think that's what where ross does it well is that he articulates and he he makes sure he He's taking the time to make sure that he's hitting those points. Right. And it doesn't hurt, and this might sound off color, but it doesn't hurt when you've got the prospective husband and wife there when Ross shows up and he's pretty handsome. <laughs> I you think know, you're biased. No, but. you know what I mean? But, you know, I mean, you're lovely, Nick, but he, but Nick, <laughs> but, but Ross. That's, awesome. That's all I was going for. <laughs> That's all you wanted. See? Good. <laughs> Well, it's funny, like you buy a car. I couldn't imagine buying a vehicle and not looking at the miles per gallon. I know. And so it, with, when it comes to a house, to you can do everything but the envelope and the systems, you rarely touch those. You might I, renovate a kitchen. I've been on a, I've been on a mission. There's two, there's two reoccurring themes to me. One is that every building should have a cost per square foot to operate badge on yeah. it, just like you buy a car, yeah. to, to your point. Right? Miles per gallon. Right. Yeah. The other thing is that every house someday should have a BTU battery, a tank that sits somewhere in the building that lets scavenged heat that comes off of refrigerators and the air conditioner uh, anywhere and it stores into this because water is the universal storage with the best transfer medium. So it stays in there and then there'd be coils inside of it that could say, I could have solar thermal on the roof and I could come and load this thing during the day. I have scavenged heat off of the air conditioner. I've got all kinds of ways, and that'll be the next thing when we really think about net zero houses in a, in a viable way. There's gonna be, and that was that what it has to be. I saw there was a product that we used to bring in from Germany back in a long time ago called Werrit, and it was a polyethylene mold, blow molded tank, handles built into the front and back of it, 28 inches so you can get it through a doorway, coils you could drop down in, pressureless tank, so you could get it in, manifold them together, and store energy, and that's where we're gonna, you know, we're gonna store electrical, you know, like yeah. with with Tesla's uh, power wall. Our clients are asking for that. Correct, but we're also gonna store energy BTUs because mm. the paradox is solar gives it when you don't need it, you know, and uh, it's yeah. also people don't want to lease this stuff. Right. Like my clients now are like, <clears throat> we don't want to lease solar, and I'm like, do you realize the power wall is you don't get a cord. Right. Like you're not connected to the. I know to the lifeline of the, no. of the service and there's no net metering and he's like 100 percent yeah and i'm like and he's going to dig into the batteries because if tesla goes out right. we still want right. to be able to find a company that think they're right in an arsenal right. street in, in watertown they make batteries right. that will do that so i shot i shot in hawaii a couple of years ago and hawaii's got so much solar making electricity that they've now passed the law that says any new house that's going on 
with solar can't ship anything back to the grid <laughs> because they don't have the storage. It, no, it was just like the utilities were going to go out of business because everybody was collecting all sun all oh. day long, yeah. and they were they were getting to bill nobody. <laughs> so it was the real life of the money side. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, so. I think the BTU storage is interesting. Yeah, have you guys dabbled with it at all? Well, what I'm do what I did in the net zero house in Jamestown is I found this this Jamestown project. I don't think I've talked to you about it, but you know we all know these heat pumps, Mitsubishi, mm-hmm. Sanyo, Hitachi, uh, LG, and they're always heat pumps, and they always can heat or cool the building, but you can't do it at the same time. And up until three or four years ago, you really couldn't get 100% contribution on a zero degree day in a cold climate like New England. So enter this thing called uh, heat recovery. Two things happen. One, the inverted technology got enough that so a, a five ton unit can give me five tons of heating at zero degrees and minus five. So that's a breakthrough. Crazy. Right? But, but the second thing is you can, it's simultaneously heat and cool. So now, think about that. I'm get, I get goosebumps so thinking about it because now you've got the sunny sides in the spring needing some cooling. Yeah, getting the solar heat What game. you do is you're picking up that energy. You're putting it in through a distribution box, and the, the box is so smart that that energy says, no, I'm not going to go outside. I'm going to go to this other room that needs it. And so I move heat versus make heat to a level that's never before been possible. And then I saw that they had in, in, in Korea, they had this heat exchanger to hot water. So if we put that on, now you can do reject heat to make domestic hot water. So it's one appliance that does simultaneously heat and cool 100% at both ends of the spectrum and makes domestic hot water. And so for that, I found this tank that acted like a BTU battery called, made by TurboMax. And so it's the heat exchangers, because I need double wall in Massachusetts, right? So the heat exchangers is just going to heat a little bit of water that goes over to fill this BTU battery. And then the coils at the top have potable water going through it. So I've, I've got my heat exchange. I think, I think this could be one of the biggest and forks you did this in the in road. In Jamestown? In Jamestown, yeah. But this could be one of the biggest forks in the road because, you know, this whole, all right, what am I going to do? Am I going to do a propane or oil or gas? Okay. And then I heat do the heating. And then I do, well, I could do hydroware. And then, you know, or I could do the multi-split, but I cannot do it heat simultaneously heat and cool. And then you have to switch every, every air conditioning thermostat has to switch from heating to cooling. Or if one's off, you know, you know what the issue is, right? Yeah. This, this fixes all of it. So we're... That's insane. We're, it's insane. And so to me, I talk about the, the forks in the road. To me, the forks in the road was the reintroduction of radiant heating into the American home. That sort of fell a little out of favor. Heatway didn't help us with that you know, junky tubing, right? The next was condensing appliances. You, you, you were always stuck at about 89% efficiency, and now you got to this paradigm shift, you can get to 96. And I think this heat recovery is gonna be as big as any of those, and then some, because you've got up to 12 zones in a, in a house, you can microzone to a level you never dreamt, mm-hmm. you know? And, and you need it in these tighter yeah, houses. That's right. It, it's so, like, we've done it right. where, I built a house a couple years ago, and we, we had multiple zones. The architect yeah. wanted, it's amazing to me. I still see drawings where you have one unit that's downstairs and it like trunks all the way up to the attic and then branches right. out. But we did it all and, and we broke it up. But there was an office that was in the back of the house. It was a cedar roof. That cedar roof got light at like a certain part of the day and it yeah. roasted that office. That's right. And out of all the rooms, and it was like, how do you then micro zone? Put, yeah. yeah, in that area. And so yeah. we were like, how do we do it? Like put a blind on. And and this client was like, I know we have a six thousand square foot house. He goes. All I want to do is be home and work on a Friday, so I'm home for my kids. And he's like, that's the one room I can't go into my entire that's house. Right, right. And it was a real, real issue. Yeah. And to be able to break that off, yeah. because yeah, different parts of the day, your solar heat gain, I know. it can change the whole game. I know, I know. You made me think of another story. We, we did a fancy, I was the engineering side of a really fancy house up in Manchester by the sea for a, some high tech genius that made millions. And so this is the earliest days of home automation. We have isonine foam, we got a radiant heating system, we got a conventional air conditioning system. So he does it, and he's got his home automation system as somebody in Minnesota monitoring his house. The recessed can lights in the building generated so much heat and the building was so tight. I mean, you, you guys know this. And so he'd get an alarm from his home automation company saying that it's overheating and and we, we're, we're proving on our side with our automation that 
that system has been off. The mechanical system has been off for days. Yeah. <laughs> you were not overheating, but you couldn't tell this guy because, you know, this, yeah. this dog fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it happened. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we did it where we've had like rooms above garages. Oh, yeah. But the thermostat's not in that wing of the house. Oh, yeah. And it's like, there's, it has to. Yeah. Like, you have to switch it out. Yeah. And there's just been so much research where, yeah. not even research. Yeah. Just troubleshooting. Oh, where yeah. you, you do it all and you've tried to think yeah. all of it out. Yeah. And then it's been an absolute nightmare. And then trying to go back in there and band-aid that, that being able to do that many mm-hmm. zones. Is, yeah. Right. I feel like it's all, it's all coming. It's so new, too, with all the energy efficiency and everything else, especially where you guys work in the older homes. So many people just for years and years, it's like you're not going to be comfortable in an older home. You know, it's impossible or the amount of money that you would spend. And it is a possibility now. So now you guys are probably fighting a battle where let's now take the money from finishes and put it towards being comfortable. Mechanicals. You know, where like people don't. It's like, well, I'd rather splurge on the kitchen, you know, mm. or the bathroom. Mm. But it's uh, also obtainable. So now people are like, all right, if that's obtainable, then I want the best. Yeah, but right. it's sparking a new conversation that wasn't always like a primary in these remodels and stuff like that, where it was, you know, it is possible now to make an older home comfortable. Speaking want, of which, I, you guys mind if I shut this window? It's getting a little drafty. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to throw one caution out there. You know, everything in our life now has got a printed circuit board. Every everything's got high tech electronics. You know, every gas, every appliance, everything. At the very same time that the American electrical grid is getting crappier and crappier, and you know, you've got voltage fluctuations. If people knew how much, so all this high tech stuff, this heat recovery thing I'm talking about, I I'm telling people to put a UPC on a uninterruptible power supply center. Because it, if you ever saw it, you'd go, are you kidding me? I'm going, you know, I thought I had 220. No, I got 218. I got two, And then it's changing all the time. And those, any of these brains, you know, you just got to protect the brain. So that's my, my cautionary tale to do it. In the, old, in the old days with the high-tech Wiesmann boilers, particularly on the islands, we always had to put these in because in the middle of some calculation, if the voltage gets too low, the brain inside the device goes... You know, I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's just a little caution. That's interesting because, like, you think you spend all this money, you think they would self-protect. Not, not enough. Yeah, not enough. I mean, they they do. They can take a punch, but no, I just mean. But even I mean, we just did a um, a tankless um, conversion on one of our projects, and we the thing kept acting acting up, and we ended up finding out that the gas pressure was just a mm. little too yep, low. Sure. And it was just, and it was con, and it was like we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. It was like I don't have hot water again. What's right. going on? Right. Um, but it is. It's like there, I, there, I are, two, na- there are two towns. Really. There are two towns that don't have enough gas supply, and I'll tell you later which they are. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record. Yeah. We had that issue in Wellesley as well. Really? Where? Wellesley. That's one. I was gonna say. That's one. And you also mentioned the other one before, Brookline. Brookline, yeah. It's what it is, is in Brooklyn, it's the infrastructure is so old below the streets they can't do it. We just we just dug up the street uh, to put it. Oh, for it, your Brookline project, for Brooklyn, yeah. Oh, my God. So there is there is this steel water main that's been in there since. <laughs> Kevin did a story on it. Yeah. Yeah, it was nuts. Well, he, yeah, he, yeah, so he was looking over our shoulder. So there it is, and we're going to stab into a 110 year old steel pipe and. It's, oh my God, it was crazy. So, dude, that's yeah. And we you, did it. That reminds me back in was it Brookline? I forget. What's the super fragile copper? Not not the water lines. We were in. A, I did a job in a in an apartment CPBC? building. No, no, it was before that. It was like co- co- lead. Yeah, I don't know if it was Brass? Lead. No, galvanized. Galvanized. Feel, well, yeah. well, galvanized you, would have electrolysis at the threads. And and it would, would break give up at the, the oh, joints. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we had this. It was like in Brookline over at Chestnut Hill, and you'd. Um, We'd like go in there and do demo, and it, you'd end up just chasing that water line. Oh yeah, like down floors. Just keep, break, yeah. break, break, it just break, keep going, break, and yeah. it was oh, just yeah. like, oh my yeah. god. Yeah, it's, fine thread brass was like that. Yeah, it, it was. And somebody weird. would come home and just hang a. They'd have a basement laundry, and they just hang one hanger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you're chasing the thing, and you're like, what am I doing? And, and I, I was too young to realize. And I'm just like, you'd be like, no, it's fine. Oh my god, it's gone. Right. Like, and then you'd be like, how do I stop this from <laughs> happening? It was scary. And, the, and then to realize that the whole building that you walk out of 
Oh, yeah. The whole thing is that. Oh, yeah. I think we used like A and K plumbing in, in the city. Oh, yeah. That was like their bread and butter was oh, like yeah. just going to fix that. Yeah, old yeah. utilities, Kappa. Kappa. plumbing, Kappa. electrical. It's fine. It's been that way for a hundred years. And as soon as you touch one thing, the entire thing goes. Yeah. No, I'm, I've ripped a, I remember I did one in um, South Huntington Avenue. We did an apartment. We demoed the the bathroom. Demoed the bathroom and the light switch that was working. It was catching on fire every time for years. Mm -hmm. So until we, it would have been doing that forever if we hadn't renovated that bathroom. Yeah. And that was just like, it blew my mind that what happens between the walls, it's kind of so astonishing. You just, you just mentioned something, so it triggered a story. In my role as a rep, you know, we have these contractors that will get on a job like you had with the, with the gas pressure. And they'll say, Richard, I'm at my wits end. So this fabulous contract, I've known him forever. He says, Richard, can you come up here? It's a it's an air conditioning system that the it's a basement system and the water keeps on leaking on the floor no matter what we've done. Now we've already changed the inside unit, the outside unit, the condensate pump. He says, I've been at this for 40 years. You know, Billy's been at it for 20, you know, and so we come there and I, I come and I take the side off the uh, air handle and I put a storm window so I can see the coil, whether it freezes. And we do all this stuff, and we, I spend two, three, four hours there. We're just going crazy. We can't figure it out. We think, could it be the drain pipe? And we chase everything. And we finally, it was like getting late, and I said, send, can you go get us a cup of coffee? And, and as the kid left the basement, and the, at the time the condensate pump was on, as the kid left the basement, he turned off the basement light. <laughs> Do you know what that means? It was tied to the circuit for the pump. So every time anybody was there, the light was out of the basement. <laughs> it was working Everything fine. Everything worked fine. Oh, like, my God. It was like unbelievable. Christmas vacation. So, so this guy, this, <laughs> this guy Eddie, this guy, lights. Eddie says, Richard, you know, this, this, I've got, we've got a hundred years of experience between it. I've probably spent 20,000 bucks here. He says, but this still no is one of the it. best stories ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's incredible. It's in always. troubleshoot, though, you always go into it. You know there's an answer somewhere. Yeah. You just got to stay with it. You got to find it. It's a, it's a, I, I find that I find it fascinating to be the detective. And, you know, because by the time I'm, we're asked in, people are at their wit's end. And so you come in with confidence because, you know, the equipment is good. And then there's going to be some anomaly. There's going to be some external factor like gas pressure or electrical supply or some, something that you'll get to the bottom of. So we, did a, we did a hyperheat system in a project in the south end. And it kept losing pressure in the line set. And what do you, what, what's the pressure in them typically? Is it like it changes all the time? Meaning in refrigerant? Yeah. It's it's change it's 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 change in pressure is directly proportional to its temperature. So so I I do but remember it could be up to it could be up to three hundred pounds. All right, so that, I thought it was somewhere around two to three hundred. So I remember super guess right there. We I know. Let's yeah. ask and then so yeah, gives you the answer. That's I know what I was just, what I was just what I was thinking. Just what I was thinking. Yeah, no, I, I, you know I, just, I know you guys pretty well now. <laughs> but I remember we we baffle them with. <laughs> we we kept we kept chasing this leak. We could not find it. Tested it. Tested it. Tested it. And finally, he had 800 psi in the line. Trying to just hear it. It was it was only like 30 feet long in the wall. Of course, could not find it. We end up ripping the entire wall open. End to end, cap both ends. I remember would this job. Fill it fit. 800 that. psi, no noise, but it would lose pressure. So if I, was there a screw in it? No idea. To this day, we, we could not. There was only one area in the wall that we couldn't open. We had a camera in there. Didn't look like there was a screw. So we ended up just running a whole brand new line. Yeah. And that was I, that was the second time I said, why don't, why don't we use that Yogi pipe? Yeah. And he's like, he's like, no. He's like, yeah. it failed last time. That's I was right. Like, oh, all right. But Yogi coming in though as the professional i know that one of the big differences for me is being able to walk onto those jobs where the customers are at their wits end and just know that you can handle it you know that confidence where you've seen it all if you haven't you can figure it out and that's why you're brought on as a pro um, so i always wish there was somebody like me when i was a contractor i was asked into a into a house this is back when we ripped all the, the stadler vega radiant and so the homeowner calls and says, they put the new radiant system in. It just isn't heating the building. So I said, all right, have the contractor go there, me and you. So the three of us are there. And so she's, she's looking at, and, she's, and we're in the room, 
and it's freezing. And she says, now, I mean, isn't it cold in here? And I swear this is true. The contractor, Steve, says, no. <sighs> and I started to laugh. I said, Steve, I can see your breath. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody dropped their armor, and we just figured it out what it was. But it was just like, I, I always wish that there was nope. somebody, somebody that could come in and arbitrate in a fun way to just get people back on, on track. Yeah. No. <laughs> it feels fine to me. Yeah, right? I like, like, three I like on. sleeping in the cold. <laughs> It's funny because you, you had mentioned a couple minutes ago about Radiant coming back, and I feel like it, it's I'm seeing it more and more. Mm-hmm. And I think there's so many products out there that make it easier. Right. Like the, the, the fast track quick, panels. Quick track and the climate panels. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, we, I, I was there when that got invented by a German guy named Joe Fiedrich. He's cutting plywood and playing around with it. And, and, uh, it it's cool, in, man. Done in it's Bed, such, Bedford, it's Massachusetts. so comfortable. Yeah. So. But we got to wrap this one up. We do. We How talk. long have we been? How long? Yeah. Doug. An hour. How long? A little over. A little over an hour? Wow. Well, I apologize now to all you podcast listeners that had to listen to us for a whole we're hour. Right, we're you right on. As far as script <laughs> goes, we're right on. Uh, as far as our script goes, we're right on time. Yeah. 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 And I see it from Johnny the story. Johnny kept queuing up the stories with yeah. you. And <laughs> That's right. We pretty much got everything yeah. cut. What's the whiteboard look like? Is there right. anything yeah, else? No, we're good, yeah. No, yeah. we're good. We and, now, and now he knows the pressure in a refrigerant system. Yeah, now he's going to use that. Well, I knew it before. I just had to double check it. I need you to tell me I was right. <laughs> well, you guys are a trip. You guys are great. I'm, I'm excited for your success. You know, you're starting to Appreciate get that. some traction. It means a lot. Yeah. So. I'm excited to work work together on you yeah. know especially yeah, for the next you'll generation be up too, yeah. and, and you'll be up uh, Brookline so we'll talk again maybe. yeah it's yeah. yeah. awesome cool Rich thank you so much thank right. you see ya what's his handle this, at this, this old this old plumber plumber and that's only because when I opened up my Twitter account it didn't have <laughs> enough characters for Richard Trithui it cut off the EY <laughs> so you so change said, it to this old plumber yeah because awesome. it was just enough that to fit his, that was his answer <laughs> yeah. to that that's amazing I could have been rich I gotta rethink it. of this yeah I don't so, even have Twitter so you're ahead of me yeah. Yeah. really well it's never gonna last Twitter <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first yeah. <laughs> you can find us on themoderncraftsman.org the period modern craftsman on Instagram you can email us at info at themoderncraftsman.org what's our Twitter handle we do not have a Twitter but we Doug do have a YouTube that. so if you guys want to see the video for this podcast leave comments oh wait a uh, minute this was on video it is I didn't sign up for that <laughs> we, you sign it on the hair way makeup out. we're good <laughs> um, but no hit us up the review if you want yeah I mean we take any sort of reviews <laughs> constructive criticism John only wants good reviews well but I think there's an opportunity we could fix stuff so shoot us a DM a text or an email and we can we get them all at info yeah at the uh, any ideas for topics new guests other discussions yeah hit us up so we're signing out on episode 2 at the International Builder Show 2019 here at the Marvin Booth see something see you soon can I drop see this mic uh, how do I drop this mic <laughs> <laughs> take care guys thank you thank, thank you for listening you. guys